welcome back to the hidden life of trees chapter 15 um, in the last chapter we was looking into um, the idea of do trees think um, because it's al already been accepted that trees can store information and have memory and how trees think if they do think and looking into the way that <coughs> electrical impulses and chemical signals are carried through the roots and a lot of the work it, a lot of the there's a lot more going on underground in the roots of trees than above ground actually I, I believe it was saying and then it was talking about this tree that um, the roots of this huge tree went back to 9,500 years old it was just wow the the time scale that trees can live on and um how they can survive things it's yeah it's amazing so this chapter is called in the realm of darkness are you sitting comfortably then i'll begin oh yeah just wanted to show you just behind me can you see the elder flowers in full bloom I've been making elderflower champagne which is really easy and really lovely and you only need four ingredients water, lemons, vinegar and elderflowers so I really recommend at the moment people go out and make it because it's really easy it takes one day to make it and ten days for it to get ready and then you drink this lovely fizzy non-alcoholic drink but it's really really nice and refreshing okay back to the book in the realm of darkness for us humans soil is more obscure than water both literally and metaphorically whereas it is generally accepted that we know less about the ocean floor than we know about the surface of the moon we know even less about life in the soil Sure, there's a wealth of species and facts that have been discovered and that we can read about, but we know only a tiny fraction of what there is to know about the complex life that busies itself under our feet. Up to half the biomass of a forest is hidden in its lowest story. Most life forms that bustle about here cannot be seen with the naked eye and that is probably the reason we are not as interested in them as we are in say wolves, black woodpeckers or fire salamanders. For trees though these creatures are probably way more important. A forest could have no problem doing without its larger inhabitants, deer, wild boar, carnivores, and even most birds wouldn't leave any yawning gaps in the ecosystem. Even if they were all to disappear at once, the forest would simply go on growing without any adverse effects. Not sure I quite agree with that, but but he might be right. Even if they were all to disappear at once, the forest would simply go on growing without any adverse effects. Things are completely different when it comes to the tiny creatures under their feet. There are more life forms in a handful of forest soil than there are people on the planet. It's just inconceivable, isn't it? I mean, I mean, a handful. Just a handful. There are more life forms in a handful of forest soil than there are people on the planet. A mere teaspoon contains many miles of fungal filaments. All these work the soil, transform it and make it so valuable for trees. Before we take a closer look at some of these creatures, I'd like you to take I'd like to take you back to when soil was first created. Without soil there would be no forests because trees must have somewhere to put down roots. Naked rock doesn't work and loosely packed stones, even though they offer roots some support, cannot store sufficient quantities of water or food. 
geological processes such as those active in ice ages with the sub-zero temperatures, cracked open rocks and glaciers, glaciers grounds the filaments down into sand and dust until finally what was left was a loosely packed substrata. After the ice retreated, water washed this material into depressions and valleys, or storms carried it away and laid it down in layers many, many tens of feet thick. Life came along later in the form of bacteria, fungi and plants, all of which decomposed after death to form hummus. Over the course of thousands of years, trees moved into this soil, which only at this stage can be recognised as such, and their presence made it even more precious. Trees stabilised the soil with their roots and protected it against rains and storms. Erosion became a thing of the past, and instead... The layers of hummus grew deeper, creating the early stages of bituminous coal, bitumin, coal. While we are on the subject of erosion, it is one of the forest's most dangerous natural enemies. Soil is lost whenever there are extreme weather events, usually following particularly heavy downpours. If the forest soil cannot absorb all the water right away, the excess runs over the soil surface, taking small particles of soil with it. You can see this for yourself on rainy days. Whenever water is brownish in colour, this means it is carrying off valuable soil. The forest can lose as much as 2,900 tonnes per square mile per year. The same area can replace only 290 tonnes. So it can lose 2,900, but it can only replace 290 tonnes annually through the weathering of stones underground, leading to a huge annual loss of soil. Sooner or later, only the stones remain. <coughs> Today, you can find many such depleted areas in the forest growing in it in forests growing in exhausted soils that were cultivated centuries ago. In contrast, forests left undisturbed lose only 1 to 14 tonnes of soil per square mile. So instead of 2,900, they lose 1 to 14 tonnes of soil per square mile per year. In intact forests, the soil under the trees becomes deeper and richer over time, so that the, the growing conditions for trees constantly improve. This brings us to the animals in the soil. Admittedly, they are not particularly attractive. Because of their small size, most species cannot be detected with the naked eye. And even if you go out armed with a magnifying glass, you won't have any luck. It's certainly true that beetle mites, springtails and uh, pseudocentipedes are, are not nearly as engaging as orangutans or humpback whales. But in the forest, these little guys are the first link in the food chain and can therefore be considered terrestrial plankton. Unfortunately, researchers are only peripherally interested in the thousands of species discovered so far and given un unpronounceable Latin names. Unpronounceable is quite a hard word to pronounce sometimes. Countless more species are waiting in vain to be discovered. Perhaps, however, we, can't take, we can take comfort from this. There are many secrets in the forest that lies directly outside your back door. Let's take a look at the little that has been brought to light so far. Let's take the aforementioned beetle or oribatide mite. Oribatide. 
orobatid mites or of which there are about a thousand known species in European latitudes. They are less than 0 0.04 inches long and look like spiders with inadvisably short legs. Their bodies are two-tone brown which blends as well with their natural environment, the soil. Mites! That brings up associations with household dust mites, which feed on the flakes of skin we shed and other waste products and may trigger allergic allergies in some people. At least some of the beetle mites act in similar ways around the trees. The leaves and fragments of bark trees shed would pile up several yards deep if it weren't for hung the hungry army of microscopic creatures ready to pounce on the detritus. So interesting. It's just, it's so interesting that things that are invisible to the naked eye make such a huge difference and have such a huge impact. It's, I mean, it's, it should be totally obvious, but when you think about it, it is like, wow. To do this, they live in the cast-off leaf litter, which they devour voraciously. Other species specialise in fungi. These creatures crouch in small underground tunnels and suck the juices that ooze out of the fungi's fine white threads. Finally, beetle mites feed on the sugar trees share with their fungal partners. Whether it's rotten wood or dead snails, there is nothing that doesn't have its corresponding beetle mite. They appear everywhere at the intersection between birth and decay, and so they must be considered essential components of the ecosystem. Makes me think about um, all the chemicals that we use that uh, go out into the environment and how the impact that they have on creatures like this and it seems like you can't see the impact so it can't be that big but can turn out to have huge devastating impacts then there are the weevils they look a bit like tiny elephants tiny elephants that have lost their enormous ears and they belong to the most species-rich family of insects in the world. In Europe alone, there are about 1,400 species. For the weevils, it's not so much about eating as it is about childcare. With the help of their long snouts, the little creatures eat small holes in leaves and stems where they lay their eggs. Protected from predators, the larvae gnaw little passages inside the plants and grow in peace. I found them in rice before. Some species of weevil, mostly those that live on the forest floor, can no longer fly because they have become accustomed to slow rhythms of forest and it's practically eternal existence. The farthest they can travel is 30 feet a year and they really don't need to be able to travel any further than that. If the environment around the tree changes because of the tree dies, all the weevil has to do is make it to the next tree and continue nibbling around there in the rotten leaf litter. If you find weevils, you can be sure the forest has a long uninterrupted history. If the forest was cleared in the Middle Ages and later replanted, you won't find these insects because it would simply have been too far for them to walk to the next old forest. Mm, that's sad. All the animals I have mentioned so far have one thing in common. They are very small and therefore their circle of influence is extremely limited. In the large old growth, forests that once covered central Europe, this didn't matter at all. 
Today, however, people have altered most of the forest. There are spruce instead of beeches, Douglas fir instead of oaks, young trees instead of old ones. The new forests are literally no longer to the animals' taste, and so they starved and local populations died out. However, there are still a few old deciduous forests that act as refuges where the original diversity of species still exists. All over Germany, forestry commissions are trying to grow more deciduous than coniferous trees once again. But if mighty beeches are to herald change and stand once again where spruce now topple in storms, how will the beetle mites and springtails get back to these places? Not by walking there, that's for sure, because they cover barely three feet in a lifetime. So is there any hope at all that one day, at least in national parks, such as the Bavarian Forest, we will once again be able to marvel at authentic old growth forests? It is entirely possible. Hmm. Research carried out by students in the forest I manage has shown that microscopic organisms, at least those associated with coniferous forests, can cover astonishing distances. Old spruce plantations show this particularly clearly. Here the young researchers found species of springtails that specialize in spruce forests. But my predecessors here in Hummel planted such forests only a hundred years ago. Prior to that, we had predominantly old beech trees, just like everywhere else in Central Europe. So how did these conifer-dependent springtails get to Hummel? My guess is that it must have been birds that brought these terrestrial creatures as stowaways in their plumage. Birds love to take dust baths and dead leaves to clean their feathers. When they do this, tiny creatures that live in the soil must surely get trapped, and they are then unloaded during a dust bath in the next forest. And what works for animals specialized for sp and what works for animals specialized for spruce probably also works for species that love deciduous trees. If in the forest, more mature deciduous forests are allowed once again to develop undisturbed, then birds can see to it that the appropriate sub-letters show up again as well. I hope so. In any event, the return of the teeny little creatures can take a very, very long time, as the latest studies out of Kiel and Lundberg attest. Sorry for mispronunciation. More than a hundred years ago, oak forests were planted on the Lundberg Heath on what had once been arable land. It would take only a few decades for the original framework of fungi and bacteria to settle the soil once again, or so the scientists assumed, but far from it. Even after this relatively long time, there are still gaping holes in the species inventory, and this deficit has grave consequences for the forest, as the nutrient cycles of birth and decay aren't functioning properly. Moreover, the soil still contains excess nitrogen from the fertilizers once used there. True, the oak forest has grown more quickly, than similar stands of trees located on ancient forest soil, but it is markedly less robust when it comes to issues such as drought. Because oh, they just grow too fast, maybe. Um, we don't know how long it will take until the true forest soil is created once again, but we do know that a hundred years is not enough. To make it possible for this regeneration to happen at all, you need preserves with ancient forests free from any human interference. These are places where the diversity of so soil life can survive 
and these refuges can be the nucleus for a recovery in surrounding areas. And incidentally, no real sacrifices need to be made to make this happen, as the community of Hummel has demonstrated for years. They have put entire old beech forests under protection and found innovative ways to, make them, make, to market them. Part of the forest is used as an arboreal mortuary. Mort oh, I really like that idea. Where the trees are leased out as living gravestones for... Gravestones for urns buried under them. I really like that idea. To become part of the ancient forest after death, it isn't that, isn't that a wonderful idea? Another part of the preserve is leased to firms as their contribution to protecting the environment. This makes up for the fact that the wood itself is not being used and both people and nature are happy. Efforts to offset the costs of protecting and restoring forests in the 21st century are happening around the world. Some combine utility with education. Tourists in the Maya Biosphere Reserve in Guatemala employ residents who would otherwise be cutting down forests to sell the lumber to grow food in the clearings. Hang on employ residents who would otherwise be cutting down forests to sell the lumber and grow food in the clearings. Some combine prestige with preservation. I didn't quite understand that part. Some combine prestige with preservation in Scotland. You can buy a piece of forest originally owned by the nobility to keep lumber companies out and help usher the return of ancient Caledonian forests. I love that idea. Yet others involved, involve unlikely partners. The US Department of Defense contributes to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation efforts to restore longleaf uh, pine ecosystems in the American Southeast on the grounds that forested buffers around military bases contributes to military readiness. There are so many ways that forests can be kept both undisturbed and productive. It's the end of the chapter. Another interesting chapter that leaves me with more questions. I, I want to go and find out more about how the different tiny organisms that live in the soil work and their they roll in so much it's, yeah it's really interesting and I'm, I'm particularly interested also in how um, bacteria which are often too small to see with the naked eye uh, could be very important in um, precipitation cycles and bioprecipitation and, and how they particularly like to live on the surface of deciduous trees and how this is a problem in monoculture for uh, pine forests where you don't have the same environment that these bacteria need but how important they could be for global uh, rain precipitation patterns so much to find out about i hope you're enjoying take care join me again for the next chapter soon bye take care i can work out how to turn this